Paul De Marinas is a sound and electronic music artist who strongly focuses on the use, construction, and augmentation of circuits and microcomputers. He composes computer music that seeks to illuminate the relationship between communication and technology, and make the listener contemplate the role machinery can play in composition and sound. He has published and exhibited a wide variety of works, including multiple music albums, music and sound devices, and exhibitions. De Marinas started his exploration into electronics when he was a child, making noises with wires, batteries, and household appliances as early as four years old. As an adult, he attended Antioch College in Ohio, getting an undergraduate Bachelor's of Art degree in music and filmmaking. While there, his fascination with electronics and the avant-garde grew. He cites Paul Sheritz, an experimental filmmaker who taught at Antioch, as being an early influence in his work. He would, however, go on to focus intently on sound in his time at Mills College, where he got his graduate's degree in electronic music and recording. It wouldn't be long before he put out his first projects. While at Mills College, he invented a small sound device that he called the Pygmy Gamelan. The Pygmy Gamelan was an electronic instrument built in 1973 that improvised five-note phrases by, as De Marina says, responding to electronic fluctuations in the galaxy. During this time, he wanted to make pieces, not synthesizers. As he once stated during an interview, I thought of myself as thinking much more in the culture of art, making objects that were pieces, sometimes requiring performances, sometimes not, sometimes standing alone. After Pygmy Gamelan, De Marinus turned his sights to exhibitions. In 1982, he created one of his most well-known pieces, Music Room. Music Room is an exhibit meant to engage non-musicians in musical performance. The piece consisted of multiple touch-sensitive guitars that required no musical ability to play, connected to an Apple II computer. The piece is widely considered to be one of the first automatic music pieces ever exhibited, and it captured the public's attention. According to De Marinus, thousands and thousands of people a week came to see this exhibit. Um, it, it got some news. It was sufficiently high profile enough that when the brother of, of King Fod came to San Francisco, this made AP wire photo and people sent it to me from all over the world. Um, the swinging Saudi, yeah. Um, unfortunately, it was during Ramadan. And as this uh, excerpt from People magazine shows, um, it was, didn't make very good press back in Saudi Arabia that he was, during Ramadan, he was out playing guitar, electric guitar in a disco. Um, I went to Japan in 1982 to try to sell the system. I talked to Casio and Yamaha and um, uh, another Sony, and nobody wanted this idea of the automatic music guitar. But like 10 years later, these kinds of things were, were uh, lost leaders at places like Target. The idea for the exhibit came to him after he caught his five-year-old son playing with a touch-sensitive guitar he'd engineered for live performances. He stated, I realized that I had automated the piece to the extent that anyone could play something that sounded like music. He continued, I think it had a lot of influence on ideas of automatic music performances in popular arenas like video games and digital music toys. It was, in 1981, probably the first new paradigm for automatic music since the chord rhythm organ of the 1950s. De Marinus was also one of the first artists to take advantage of computers, period. He's reflected on the fact that before he started doing sound projects on them, computers were known for their military application only. In his early days as an artist, he was one of the few who wanted to create work using computers. Many artists saw them as an annoyance. One of his contemporaries, Nicholas Collins, after telling De Marinus this, was replied, Don't think of it as a computer. Think of it as a big, expensive logic chip. This would go on to become a defining aspect of De Marinus's work. In the years to come after Music Room, De Marinus would create many sound exhibitions, many of which were interactive. He created Voice Creatures, a series of synthetic personalities with voices who responded to visitor interactions. He also created Alien Voices, in which two antique phone booths were outfitted with electronics to augment visitors' voices as they talked to one another through the handsets. During this time, De Marinus also released many recorded music projects. In 1980, he released If God Were Alive, and He Is, You Could Reach Him by Telephone. Take a listen now. 
dot This track is emblematic of De Marinus's burgeoning fascination with language, tone, intonation, and juxtaposing technology with spirituality and organic humanity. A speak and spell voice speaks in the background while a woman sings and speaks disjointed and seemingly random words. De Marinus collaborated with many artists during his time at Mills College and afterward. However, his first solo album wouldn't come out until 1991 with the release of Music as a Second Language. This album is a deep dive into the relationship between human languages and the languages of technology and sound. The sounds and techniques that De Marinus employs offer a variety of feelings and emotions. Often, his choices make you feel nostalgic, at other moments, haunted. This album is also playful. Odd Evening, for example, follows the rhythms and intonations of spoken language with a joyful, carefree set of electronic instruments. The very next track, An Appeal, seems to use a real recording from a court case against an insurance company. However, the voice of the judge has been vocoded and digitally processed to have a robotic tone. De Marinus seems to imply that these everyday recordings, recordings of language used in a functional way, are ripe beds for reflection and criticism. After all, we have only been able to record court cases for a few decades. The opportunity for a musician to obtain and sample such a recording is an act of criticism and reflection in and of itself. Cincinnati 1830 to 1850 uses a similar technique. A gruesome description of a meat factory's operations is juxtaposed by music that follows along and guides our emotions. As we hear about crushing an animal's skull, a happy tune follows along. However, this tune darkens, and in time to hear the narrator state such lines as, killing itself cannot be mechanized. Such a line can reveal some of De Marinus's intentions for using such a sample. Much like the role of a machine, a meat factory does not have functions of empathy or pause. The electronic nature of this track makes it especially haunting and difficult to listen to. Other samples, such as the voice of a hypnotist, play out in a similarly reflective and contemplative way on other tracks. In the 1990s, De Marinus continued to create exhibitions. Grey Matter, in 1995, produced sound and sensation with the help of human touch. The piece, in contrast to many of the plain interactive exhibits of the 1990s, required you to insert your hand into a 400-volt electrical circuit, sometimes resulting in pain. Rain Dance utilized streams of water that would create frequencies and notes when they hit the patron's umbrellas, resulting in a song that ended the moment the umbrella was removed. There are streams of water that fall and the water is organized. It's organized water. So the water is organized into so many droplets per second. And if, you know, 440 droplets fall onto the umbrella, that plays the note A. You know, 260 droplets per second play the note C, middle C on the piano. So um, that's how it plays melodies. So what I did is I invented a device that could do this. As years went by, De Marinus made a point to lean into the wonder of sound technology. Once when exploring the sound art projects of the Victorian era, he lauded the goofiness of their simple electric experiments and the minimal music effects that they had. De Marinus might have created complex electronics for his art, but it was always important to keep them simple and effective, just like the Victorians. De Marinus has continued to utilize themes of technology, confrontation, and wonder in his more recent work. Hypnica, first exhibited in 2007, 
is a piece that employs a series of talking metronomes that try to hypnotize the listener into a trance. These analog metronomes are a good example of De Marinus' use of lost or outdated technologies in which he analyzes and contemplates their functions in the renewed context of art. The Harp Sun and the Moon, after Luigi Rosolo and Ken Nordine, first exhibited it in 2019, features computed sounds that are influenced by passing shadows of the sun and moon, occasionally interrupted by environmental samples, such as electric buzzers or car horns. Dame Marinus has had many residencies over the years, but he is currently teaching at Stanford and continuing to create work. The themes he evokes in his electronic music are more pertinent today than ever before, and he continues to dialogue with and criticize the role of technology and sound in our everyday lives.